Oh, the lads will come on. <laughs> it's like being at the opticians. <laughs> okay, got it. Hello, Hello good, good morning. Good morning. It's um, Sunday morning, beautiful morning. Absolutely agreed, it is delightful. December the 16th, Yeah, the sky, is, the sky is blue and the sun's shining. All at peace with the world. Can you tell me... December the 16th, 2012. Correct. Can you say your full name and date of birth? My full name is Leslie Walter King. I was born on the 1st of January 1920. And where, where were you born, Grandad? The Nightingale Home, London Road, Derby. So, and how old are you? Am I, how, old how old am I now? Yes. 92. 92? So you'll be 93 on January the 1st. Correct. 2013? Yes. Well, that's a very wonderful long life. I hope there's a bit more to go, <laughs> providing I keep sound of mind. <laughs> so can you tell us about your early years growing up in Derby? My early years growing up in Derby. Times were tough. Unemployment was rife. Lots of people were out of work. But my father had a job. So we were fortunate. We were always well fed, well clothed. And for that, must be very grateful because so many people were in a very poor state. What did state. he do? What, what did he do? What was his job? He was a, 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 a groundsman on the Derby Corporation Parks Department. He maintained all the bowling greens and tennis courts and putting greens. And very good he was. So he had a love of out, the outdoors? Outdoor, yes. He also used to drive the motorboat round Orbiston Lake. Did he? Taking passengers round the mm. lake. Mm. And uh, that was extra duty. Did he do that all his life? Yes, yeah. I, I don't remember him ever having other jobs. That was one, one and only. And what about your mother? My mother was a housewife. She was, um, I mustn't say this really, she was an unofficial money lender. Oh. Didn't you know that? Well, she was. She could have been clapped in irons. <laughs> but she used to, uh, she was very businesslike. And she was an unofficial money lender. So did she make money on that? Of course. Ah. She loaned money and charged interest. Yes. Yeah. And what about any brothers and sisters? One brother, Bill, six years younger than, than, than me. And he was born on the 10th of December, 1926. And he died just recently. And um, what was your school like in Derby? I went to St. Mary's Roman Catholic School wonderful school, wonderful teachers, and uh, it was a happy, happy school to go to. I played sport for the school, I played football, I played cricket for the, for the St Mary's, and I can remember all these years the team that, that turned out for St Mary's on Saturday. In goal was a man named Joe Hilton, all these were Roman Catholics. Right back was a chap named Wilf Cart Cartwright. Left back was a chap named Bill Wilde. Right half was a man named Paddy Burke. Centre half was a man named John Collins. Left half was a man named Tommy Clegg. Outside right was a man named Dennis Carney. Inside right was a man named Joe Butler. Centre forward was Les King. Inside left was Jimmy Avenel. And outside left was Ted Lee. How about that? I played uh, cricket as well, as I said, for the school, St Mary's. And I had one, playing one game at uh, Chester Green, which was a sports ground in Derby. I was the opening bowler and we were playing St Paul's. And they were all out for 12. And I took seven wickets, all bowled, for one run. And we, and we won 
Mind you, we didn't do very well. They were 12 all out and we were about 14 for six. <laughs> Low scoring game. Why yeah. did you go to a Roman Catholic school? Why? Because my parents, well, my parents on my mother's side were strict Roman Catholics and I was brought up as a Roman Catholic. Did they come from Ireland? They came from Ireland, but not my father. My father came from Ticknell, which was a village in Derbyshire, a very pretty village. But on the Irish side, my mother's side, my grandparents, and their surname was Mar, M-A-H-E-R, they came from Ireland, from Cork. So was your mother born in Ireland or in England? Uh, born in Ireland. Your mother was born in Ireland? Yes. How old was she when, she, when they moved? Do you, oh, when she came know? to England. Mm. I'm not quite certain on that. Uh, she was quite young. I would think probably quite young, yeah. She was one of six, four girls and two, two boys. Her brothers were Martin, he was the eldest, and then David, and then my aunt Margaret, my mother's sister, then my mother, then my aunt Kathleen, and then my aunt Agnes, who became a nun and died quite young. What was your mother's name? Mary. Mary Ma. Mary Ma. So was it a strict Roman Catholic school? Oh, very. Yeah. I made my first Holy Communion on the 29th of June, St Peter and St Paul's Day, 1929. And I was confirmed a year later by the Bishop of Nottingham, the very Reverend Ellis, E-double-L-I-S, but uh, confirmed at St Mary's Church in Derby. But there was only one bishop, the Bishop of Nottingham, he up in the whole diocese, as they called it. And have you kept up that faith? Have what? Have you kept up the Roman Catholic faith? No, I haven't. I, I, I adhered to it during my wartime life, but then I, I began to default some years ago. And I don't feel too guilty, which I did at one time, but I don't now. Was that to do with your wartime experiences? Not necessarily. It was when I began to think more deeply about lots of things I'd been taught, I realised there were man-made laws and that was, I wasn't prepared to accept them. So, uh, Such as? And Can you give an example? Can I give an example? Well, the things that we've taught, if, we'd, if we died, we'd go to hell. I thought, oh, I can't accept this. If we go to hell, I thought God was all forgiving. He didn't banish us to furnaces down below. Anyway, how do we know that those heavens up there? It might be down there for all we know. Things that we were taught, but when you get, you think more deeply about them. I just thought, no, I can't, uh, I can't accept these anymore. So, after your schooling in Derby, I started work on my birthday, my fourteenth birthday, in the Derby Corporation Park Department office, which was at the Arboretum in Derby and I was there for six months and then I became an apprentice horticulturalist and I went to Derby Arboretum which was one of the finest parks in the country not only in Derby and I had um, 18 months there the head gardener was a man named Frank Wielden but I worked in the greenhouses and the foreman there was a man named Will Peach. He came from Norwich, Norfolk, and he lived in the lodge at the Arboretum. And I was at, my, at to the Arboretum for 18 months and I went to Darley Abbott, uh, to Mark Eaton, 
and the head gardener there was a man named Jack Spivey, who was a wonderful man, but he liked to drink. And he used to clear off at lunchtime to the local pub and come back half sussled. And one day we were in the potting shed and the park superintendent, a man named Mr. T.S. Wells, <coughs> who was a Yorkshireman, he came to Mark Eaton and the, the man underneath Mr. Backfield was a man named Lou Henson, who was the deputy. And Mr. Wells, the park superintendent, came in the potting shed this particular day and he said to Mr. Henson, where's Spivey? Spivey's the head gardener. And, and Jack and Lou Henson said, I don't know, sir. It was here a few minutes ago. And Wells said, don't lie to me, Henson. Don't lie to me. Tell me where he is. And he was under a tree in the wood. <laughs> that thing is drink dry out. <laughs> don't lie to me, Henson, he said. Oh, dear. Things were tough those days. And then, of course, the war came. Oh, then I went to Dolly Abbey. A wonderful park. The head gardener there was a man named Maxfield. John Maxfield, strict man. Very strict. But uh, wonderful park, glorious, but Dolly Abbey. And I was there when the war broke out. 1939, September 3rd. And I was 19 and nine months old. And it had been announced that the caller page would be 20. Well, I was going to be 20 in three months, September, and I wanted to go in the Navy. And when I was 20, I went to try to join the Navy for the duration of the war, but it wasn't possible. You had to sign on for 12 years. Seven, seven on the reserve and five on the actual Navy. But people were saying, oh, the war won't last five years, but it lasted longer. And then eventually I went into the army. 4981685 was my number. And I reported at Normanton Barracks on the 24th of June, 1940, with about 400 other draftees, as they called us, and I went to a place called Eggington, which is near Burton-on-Trent, <coughs> to do my training. You seem a very erudite, informed gentleman. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Did you consider your education to be good? My education was excellent. A wonderful school, <coughs> wonderful teachers, strict. They were strict. We had a headmaster by the name of B.J. Halliday. And during the war, he became a major in the Royal Artillery. The French teacher was a man named, a, a, a lady named Frances Coolshed. Beautiful looking woman. And she went in the army and she became a brigadier. Frances Coolshed. Mm. Of course, long dead. And then the science teacher was a man named Mr. O'Neill, who was also the sports minister. The woodwork man was a man named Mr. Conway. Two nuns, Sister Saviour and Sister Burton, who taught English and history. Miss Moran, who was my favourite Irish lady, she taught arithmetic and dictation and French. Beautiful lady. And I played football for St Mary's, but the team of the, day, of the time, school team, was a team called Brighton Road. Brighton Road School. They had a wonderful football team and I always wanted to play in, for Brighton Road, but it wasn't a Catholic school. And I persuaded my mother, put, um, to let me leave St Mary's and go to Brighton Road, where I hoped to be able to play football for them. One Sunday afternoon I'd been out in Alberston Park, I suppose, when we came, came home, sitting in our house, 
was Miss Moran. She'd come to tell me to go back to St Mary's. How many would do that? School teacher coming to your home, wanting to know why I left. And my mother felt guilty. And I went back to how St Mary's. Long, so I never did play for Brighton Road. <laughs> when I was born, we lived in Trinity Street. That was with my grandparents, the Mars. And then we got a council house at number one Westminster Street, Alberston. And that meant travelling on the tram, there were trams those days, from Alberston to Derby Marketplace. They used to terminate there, and then from the marketplace you used to have to walk to St Mary's, a good mile. But the buses, the trams didn't go any further. And my mother used to take me. And then when I got older, I was on the bus or the tram on my own to St Mary's uh, until I was 14. And how old were you when you started? At school, six. Ah, six to 14. Yeah. And every, when I played for St Mary's, you may, I may have told you this, Every, we played on Saturday mornings. Mr O'Neill was the sportsmaster and he always came with us. And the Derby paper at the time, which was known as the Derby Express, they had a sports department and every Saturday morning one of their reporters used to cover a schoolboy game. And on one occasion it was St Mary's and we were playing Christchurch on their ground, which was Normanton Park. Normanton Park, that's where Christchurch played. And this particular morning, we were playing Christchurch, and the reporter came, and his report appeared the following Saturday. And I remember it word for word. Christchurch were hardly up to the standard of St Mary's, who, playing well within themselves, were able to claim two valuable away points. The play was well contested. Kings scoring the only two goals for St Mary's who have yet to lose her first game. Mm -hmm. How about that? I was about 12. Hmm? Cricket? Yes, played cricket for St Mary's. Then I played, when I was at the, when I started on the parks department, <coughs> I was the youngest player ever to play for the Derby Parks cricket team. And we were in the Knots and we were in the Derby and District League then. And uh, I played for them, for the Parks Department. And then when the war came, when the, after the war, I tried to get the team going again in the Parks, but there was no interest. But I was persuaded to join a cricket team in the name of Scarsdale. Uh, it was a man that used to work on the parks department, a joiner by the name of Harry West. He got this team together called Scarsdale. And he, wrote, he came, we had, didn't have a phone, and he came to see me to see if I'd play for this new team. Scarsdale and I agreed and that's where I met Frank Halsworth, 1947. So Frank and I both played for Scarsdale in 1947. And then we got, then we played in the Notts and Derby Border League, which was much higher than the Derby and District Cricket League. And then Frank and I, he became a secretary I became captain on two occasions. Uh, I was with the club 19 years, till I left Derby to go to the Isle of Wight. And we had a farewell, they had a farewell do for me at the Sherwood Hotel. Can you remember that? Mm. And they presented me with a, a, a tankard, which I've got still at, at, at home, with my initials on it. Scarsdale Cricket Club, 1947 to 1965. The town, they gave mum 
Crown Derby and flowers at the Sherwood Hotel. Going back to the war, yeah. Um, what what happened when you enlisted? What was the? I went for training for twelve weeks into Staffordshire, and then I was singled out for promotion. I got, and I was determined I was going to make something, and I had one strike, one strike that none sewed on for me, and then I joined the 14th Battalion Sherwood Foresters who were then stationed at Withensey near Scarborough, Bridlington on the Yorkshire coast and I joined the, up there in November 1940. I was called up in June and went to Withensey in 1940 which coastal patrol looking out for German invaders. And what was, what was the feeling at that time? Were you, were you scared? My personal feeling? Yeah. I suppose I felt something of pride, really, to think that uh, I was doing something useful. Did you agree with the war, going to war? Oh, I think so, because Hitler was determined to conquer Europe and if it hadn't have been for the English Channel, it would have done. If, if, if that strip of water hadn't been there, we'd have been overrun. Because the Germans were so efficient, so good, well prepared for war. I, I, I admire the German soldier like I admire the Russian. They were... Um, but fortunately, they didn't invade because of the RAF. I went, spent that morning with my mother, December the 18th, then I went to Elm Tree Avenue, waited for her coming from work, then we went to the Cavendish Cinema and I took her home. Then I walked home all the way from Elm Tree Avenue to Olverston. Blackout, pitch black dark. And, that, uh, that? and it took me about two hours because I was still walking with a walking stick because my ankle hadn't quite recovered. And then when I got home, I went up the garden path and I could see a faint chink of light because it was blackout, you had to black out everything and this was about one o'clock, middle water? of the night. What's your water? It's all right, it's nearly gone. And then when I got home, indoors my mother was dead. My aunt was there, my aunt Margaret, my father, Bill, Neighbours, either side, she died at 20 to 10, had a heart attack, 49. And I walked all the way back to Elm Tree Avenue. And when I got there, was in blackness, in darkness, we were all in bed. And then they got an outside toilet. So I sat on the seat until dawn began to break. And I walked all the way home. I didn't even wait for them to get up, the Ogdens. It must have been a complete daze. So what, she was very young? 49. Do they, did they know what had caused it? Well, the next, the, in the paper the following night, and it was given as a congealed clot of blood under the heart. Sudden death. And how did that affect your family? Oh, terribly so. Yeah, terrible. My father was in a hell of a state. And Bill was six years younger. Bill ran, ran for the doctor. No telephones. He had about a quarter of a mile to run for the Shardlow Road. And the doctor came. Bill came back in the doctor's car. 
and um, she was done. We prayed her on Christmas Eve. And I, sh I should have reported back to Withensee after two weeks leave. On Christmas Day, 1940, we were invited to my Aunt Margaret's for Christmas dinner, but none of us went, my, my father, neither my father Bill or me. Do you know what we had for Christmas dinner? Toast and dripping. That was on... How did, how did your father cope? Oh, terrible mess. Couldn't... And then when I should have gone back to Withensee, I, I realised I was going to ask for an extension. And I wrote to the commanding officer to explain what had happened. <clears throat> and on the morning that my letter was received, a dispatch rider came. That's an army motorbike driver. And he came. I'd got to report to Normanton Barracks the next morning. And I went and saw the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Menno, wonderful man. Very rich family in Derbyshire. They used to be known as the Menel Hunt. Have you ever heard of them, them mm. Lieutenant Colonel Menno? Mm. And I went to explain the situation. And he granted me further two weeks leave. But when, when you've been away from your battalion longer than a fortnight, you lose any stripes that you may have. So, of course, I had to remove my one stripe that I got. I never bothered again after that. Why not? I don't know. And after the war, what was left of us, we had a reunion that spawned at the Half Moon Hotel. And I found myself sitting next to... Bill came. He shouldn't have done, really, but I got permission for Bill to come. I found myself sitting to a man who was a sergeant major. His name was Thomas Prey. He came from Nottingham. And I sat next to him. And he said, there's something about you, he said to me, that I've never forgotten. And I said, and what was that, Tom? Why weren't you at least a sergeant? I'll never understand. He said, you got the bearing, you were intelligent, you got everything that was needed, and yet... So why did, why did you give up? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. When I'd had this extension leave, I went back to Normanton Barracks and the commanding officer said to me, he wanted to know how things were at home, and I said, well, they're improving. He said, I'll, I'll do my best to keep you here as long as I can. And I went on the telephone exchange. I think I told you this. He said, have you worked a telephone exchange? I said, no, sir. Never. He said, well, and the, the man that I was with, there used to be a man, a, a, a well-known Derbyshire tennis player. Oh, what the heck was his name? Roger Taylor. Who? Roger Taylor? No, 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 no he was the Yorkshire man. Uh, this man I was with, was, he was a corporal. Derbyshire. And he, he coached a Dutch player, man. It was coach of the... Oh, dear. Anyway, irrelevant. He and I worked this telephone exchange together. And it, it, the, the eyeballs used to drop down. Have you seen them? Doll's eye. Oh, put, yeah. Put me through to the adjutant, please. You turn the handle up, put the plugs in. And um, I had that for about two months. That was very good. And I was near home. Yeah. And I had to leave. And by this time they were in Lamborn, in Berkshire. In Berkshire. Mm. So I went, joined them at Lamborn. Then we moved to Cranley. Mm. That was where Jenny's first husband came from, mm. Cranley. Then we went from there to Ash, Aldershot. And from there to Dunsfold, in, near Guildford, Godalming. Wonderful, loved it. And that, then we went abroad. And your mum used to come down to Dunsfold. You weren't married then, were you? Not to begin with. And then, you know, I've all, we used to play whist at home, Bill and my mum, and my dad and me. My mum, my mum and I used to partner each other, 
against Bill and my father, whist, play whist, Sunday night, whist, right. One, that, one day I was out in Dunsfold, oh, I love Dunsfold, and I looked at the WI hut, Women's Institute, whist drive every Tuesday. I thought, oh, interesting. So I went, I was the only serviceman there, and it was mostly women, too few men, but, and they made me welcome. And I sat, they put me down on the table and said, this is your partner, her name was Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> and she ran a boarding house in Dunsfold. And she said to me, I hope you can play, young man, she said, because I take it very seriously. <laughs> yeah. I said, oh, I'll do my best, madam. I'll do my <laughs> but then they realised I could play. And then Nan used to come down and stay at Mrs. Thatcher. And then we got married. And then she came down. And um, then I left. We left uh, Dunsfold on May the 8th, 1942, by troop train from Guildford. We travelled through the night and we made a stop. You know where we were? Derby. Yeah, stopped at Derby, middle of the night, then went on to Scotland. Then we sailed from Glasgow, Gorok on May the 10th, 1942, on an American ship called the Orizaba. Terrible thing, awful. It was the biggest convoy to have left England at the time. And we left Gorak on the 10th of May, 1942. Two weeks sailing, we arrived at Freetown. And that's on the west coast of Africa. And that's where we replenished. I remember seeing all the little black kids in the water. We used to throw them coins. We used to dive for coins. Then we were at sea again. We stopped at Durban, South Africa. Wonderful, wonderful. The lights were on. The city was ablaze with light. After leaving blacked out England, all these wonderful sights of Durban. And the ship developed a fault. We were very pleased about that. So the rest of the convoy sailed on and we had to be repaired. So we had to leave the ship and we went in some buildings owned by Dunlops, the tyre people, Dunlops Tyres. And we were there for about a week till they repaired this damn thing. And then they did. Then we set sail. Do you know where our next port of call was? Bombay, India, India. So this, was this the first time you'd ever left the UK? Oh yes, yeah. So it must have been an incredible experience. Oh, it certainly was, Jess, yeah. Oh yes, it went to Bombay. And it was, uh, we were only, only there for three days. But one day we went out into, I, I was friendly with Two Londoners, one from Wood Green and uh, Albert Bunyan, killed, and the other from Albert Hadkin, uh, Leightonstone, badly wounded at Tantio. And, um, and three of us went into Bombay town. All the poverty was terrible. Beggars they used to spit this red beetle nut on this spout. It was red. And they were begging begging. But we went into a naffy and Mum's brother, Les, he was in the Royal Engineers. And when he left England, he left England in February, the same year I left in May, he went with the cross keys, was their symbol. And we were in this naffy and I saw some Royal Engineers with the same symbol and I went to them. And I said, oh, you wouldn't happen to know a man named Les Ogden, of course, would you? Oh, if you'd have been here yesterday, he's gone up to Pune. If I'd have been in there yesterday before, I'd have met him. Yeah, he'd gone up north to Pune in India. He finished in India. Why were you in India? Oh, I don't know. It was a mistake. Then we got back on the ship again and sailed up to Egypt. Mm. Port Sai, mm. Egypt. 
And had you seen any action by this point? Oh no, the first real action was Alamein. What happened there? Oh, what happened there? Well, we arrived in Egypt in June. June, July, 40, and then we were acclimatising to the desert. Exercisers lived in tents, and the flies and the heat, terrible, but bitterly cold at night time. Then, of course, we had two or three generals come, then Montgomery came, General Montgomery, and interviewed us all. They all had to gather round. And he said that there was no more retreat. We'd come back as far as we could, Alamein. The Germans were on the way to Cairo. So we dug in at Al Alamein until we were able to launch an offensive, which occurred on the 23rd of October, 1942. And that's when the 10-day battle, tough dust, Rained, it rained, you wouldn't believe it, it rained. And then we lost quite a few. We were in the, I was in the 9th Armoured Brigade in the 2nd New Zealand Division. That's why I wanted to go in the New Zealand Police Force. Got to know some New Zealanders. And um, then we lost that many men at Alamein. That then we, we were withdrawn from the front line and I went on a week's leave to Cairo. What was your job in El Alamein? What was? What was your role? The infantry behind the tanks, stabbing and firing at Germans, with, but we had the mortars, the bombs. So can you describe? You, you can never tell who you'd killed and who you hadn't. But there's, so how close were you? Oh, 200, 300 yards. And of course, the whole our main battle began with a terrific barrage of 800 guns into the German lines. And that occurred at 20 minutes to 10, full moon, on the 23rd of October 1942. And what can you describe the, the chaos, chaos, absolute chaos, blinded by dust storms, didn't know where the hell you were going, just charging forward. And what did you think this could be it? I could die. Frightened to death. Yeah, I've got. To, I must show you something that when you come down from the general about the what part we played. Yeah. Then I had a week sleep in Cairo. We had a choice of two. Could either go to Alexandria or Cairo. And I chose Cairo. I wanted to go to the museum. I'd heard about the Egyptian museum. Did you feel did you feel strange? Lost quite a, the first man to kill all the time was a man named Steve Barnes. He was killed by a sniper. Came from Chesterfield. Lovely man. Stallman he was. He was the first one so killed. So did you just see the bodies everywhere? Oh, oh, lots of bodies, German and British. Tanks on fire. Indescribable. Was it well, the Germans began to retreat. And we followed them for ten days. And then we were so exhausted, the battalion, that we were withdrawn and were given the leave. And that's why I went to Cairo. And then on the 1st of January, my birthday, 1943, we left on an unknown destination, which was across the Syrian desert. And we finally finished up in Baghdad. But on the journey, that was just by road. It took three weeks from Egypt, all along Jerusalem, Haifa, Beirut. Some sores began to appear on my thigh. Nasty little on my left leg. 
all these swords began to appear. And I thought, what on earth? Anyway, we had the, uh, the MO was a man named Dr Gibbons, killed later at Anzio. And we stopped one day for maintenance on the vehicles. And I thought, I'd better go and see him. And Gibbons. And I went, he had a tent on his own. And it was scorching hot. And I went in this tent. And I said, well, I don't know what these are, sir. And he looked, and he got some tweezers. And he began, and I felt myself passing out. He got these tweezers, piercing all his next to head hand, flat out. And, um, oh, he messed me about, and I never got anywhere. And it was dermatitis. And we got to Baghdad, and they put me into hospital. The 54th British General Hospital in Baghdad, Baghdad to treat these blessed things. What was the hospital like in Baghdad? It was a British hospital, but it was brick so far up, and then from the top it was all canvas, tent. It was okay. The priest used to come and visit me, the Catholic priest, because I was straight Catholic then. They taught me how to play chess. It used to be, he brought a chess board one day. He said, have you ever played chess? I said, no, no, Father, I haven't. He called them fathers. All right, well, I'll, I'll teach you. So he came to teach me. And was, was dermatitis the worst injury you had sustained so far? Did it work, chess? Had you had any other injuries? No, I've been fortunate. No, lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Well, when I told you, when we left England, Dunsfold, six of us were in the room, in bunk beds, six of us, Corporal Parker from Burton-on-Trent, killed, Trevor Griffin, Derby, hairdresser, killed, Atkin, Leightonstone, Anzio, wounded, Murdoch, Chesterfield, Stinker Murdoch, wounded Alamein, but Albert Bunyan, Wood Green, wounded in Italy, and I was the only one. And we were together all the time. And I was the only one that never. First of all, what's your opinion of Egypt? Interesting. You an interesting country. I remember you had a little quote from the men. Land of heat and sweaty pores, sandstorms, flies and desert sores, streets of sorrow and streets of shame, streets without a bloody name, streets of filth and smelling dogs, Arabs, thieves and pestering wogs, Arabs heaven, soldiers hell, land of the pharaohs, fare thee well. <laughs> A soldier's farewell to Egypt. Oh dear. But when you were in the museum, did you see, did you see the pyramids? Or oh not in the yes, museum? of course. I rode on a camel at the, at the pyramids. Oh, you did. Went inside the biggest one. But you can't do that now. No. You could see the tombs when we were there. Mm. It was so stiflingly hot. But yes, but to say you can only stand the outside now. So we the, were able to go inside the tomb. So there are some good cultural memories of Egypt. Oh, there are. Yes. Yeah. The, the little shoe shine kids were a bit of a pain in the ass. You were confronted by kids wanted to clean your shoes. Yeah. And they'd say so many pesetas and they'd clean one shoe. Pesetas? And then wouldn't do the other one until you'd paid them some more. <laughs> they do want you, oh. little devils. Cheeky. Oh, and they want yes, you, you, you fell in love with Beirut. I did. Yes. And the first day back, we went on a route march, and the blessed things reappeared again. And I lowered my leg and my ankle, an instep. Oh. And we'd been, and I was with a chap from Chesterfield, Eric Peake. Peake. Eric P to court a corporal and we took our things on he said what's that smell 
It was my blessed. And he said, oh, you'll have to go. I said, no, I'll do it myself, Eric. No, he said, you can't. So I went to the MO, it was the same man, he Kippens. He hadn't been killed, and that came later. And he said, I'm not messing about with you. Straight in hospital at Beirut. And how long were you there? Month. Then they treated it. And it cleared out. I had to go convalescent. And it was in a lovely hotel. Uh, hospital overlooking the Mediterranean and then I came out we moved to all the way up North Africa to Algiers all the way back to the desert Alamein, City Barani, Tobruk, uh, Buk Buk, Alamein, City Barani, Tobruk, Benghazi all the way to Libya, to Libya, Libya, all the way to Algiers. We were stationed outside Algiers, and and then it was uh, this was in nineteen forty three, and we spent Christmas in Algiers. What were you and, doing? Uh, what were you doing there? Prepare well, we thought we were coming home to take part in the Second Front, the invasion of Europe. That's what we thought we were there for. But no, we got on landing craft and went to Naples. Ah. Sailed to Naples, Italy. Then it's from Naples we got in landing craft and landed at Anzio. This was still the same battalion. This was not the... January 1944. This was under Montgomery still, Monty. Oh, Montgomery had left. Oh. He'd gone to join Eisenhower for the main event on Europe. What happened at Anzio? Well, we broke out eventually. After five months, we were pinned down by... Uh, our, you know, Rome is surrounded by seven hills. Mm. You've heard of the seven hills of Rome. And the Germans controlled all of them and they could see what was happening on the Anzio beachhead. And they blasted daylight out of us and we lived underground. We had to dig down and make places on the ground. And then we used to get, every now we used to get Anzio Lily, a German female used to broadcast to us. Good evening, British soldiers. I've got some terrible news for you. Last night, German bombers bombed Coventry or oh. London or Portsmouth oh. or whatever, severe damage was done to the industrial works and Coventry. But uh, if you would like your family to be informed that you were safe, approach the nearest German soldier and tell him you wish to surrender oh. and you will be taken prisoner <laughs> and your family will be informed that you are safe and well. Wow. And out of the war. Oh, yeah, and, and the old Lily. And oh. did anyone fall for it? Hmm? Did anyone fall for it? Not that I know of. Were you tempted? Of, she had a very seductive one. Then they used to sing Lily Marlene to us. Wow. <laughs> weren't, weren't you getting any broadcasts from the British no, side? No. No. And they had a, a very powerful anti aircraft gun, which was called Anzio Annie. It used to blast the daylights out of them. It was an 88 millimetre gun, German, and um, it, it played havoc. We entered Rome on the 6th of June, 1944, after being pinned down on the Anzio beachhead for five months. That's where Atkin was wounded. We, we shared the dugout together. And he never came, uh, one night he never came back and he'd been hit by shell fire and he'd been on a hospital ship to Naples and then transferred back to England. What do you mean you entered Rome? What, what, what victoriously? What, what, who? When you entered Rome, yeah. was that the Germans, you'd, be, you'd defeated the Germans? Of course. Yeah. Rome was an open city. 
Now, if it wasn't going to be bombed because of the treasures mm. that associated with Rome. So it was an open city. But then I had, <coughs> I had five days leave at the American Army Rest Camp. And we saw Irving Berlin in person. He came. Mm. Then I, that's when I went to the Vatican. And kissed the Pope's... Pope Pius Twelve. Kissed, <coughs> kissed his ring. Kissed the ring on his finger. So now we're in Rome and it's nine, June 1944. 1944. Then after they leave in Rome... But that was a terrible battle, wasn't it, Anzio? Oh, of course it was. Was that worse than El, El Alamein? It lasted longer. Mm. And we were pinned back. And it was because we had an American general who got fired, got sacked. When the landings were made, it was dead easy, but instead of keeping going, he decided to Hold dig back. in on the beach. In the on the beachhead. In the meantime, German troops that had been resting in northern Italy, when Rommel realised what a threat it was, German troops were quickly brought down okay. and held us, pinned us down for five months. How did you win the battle then? Eventually, we had reinforcements from from England, um, more more tanks, and we were able to. But I've got a book on Anzio, written by well, that well-known broadcaster. Oh, I'll show you when I come. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, uh, I, I know his name. I think. <coughs> And he said he'd, uh, he came across a field of dead, of Sherwood Foresters, and he'd never seen so many dead people in his life, the Sherwood Foresters. Mm. But that's what annoyed lots of people. We were in the American, but the Grenadier Guards were on Anzio, the Coldstream Guards, the Royal York, the Hampshire Regiment, the Yorkshire Regiment, Sherwood Foresters, uh, Shropshire Light Infantry, and we, none of the British troops got a mention. It was all America, and even an American general after the war said he was embarrassed by the fact that British troops were never mentioned on the Antio beachhead. He said, I feel embarrassed. They, they were, I think the strength of the uh, beachhead, American, British, would be about 40,000, mm -hmm. of which 10,000 mm -hmm. were British. So 25%? Yeah, those guards went up the eastern coast to a place called San Savino, in northern Italy. And it was the last action of the 14th Battalion, because we'd got that many casualties, they couldn't be reinforced. The second front had begun and I was transferred to the Durham Light Infantry and it grieved me greatly. I was the only one. What, what pals I'd got left went to the Royal Leicestershire Regiment or the Royal the Lincolnshire and I was the only one that went to the Durham Light Infantry and I nearly deserted. I was so upset and uh, but they persuaded them, no, don't do that. Don't. Where were they based? Sorry, but, where was what? Where, where, did, where were they? Where did you join them? This is what I'd gone up with, of Italy. And then when the, then I joined the Durham Light Infantry, who were in that area. Oh, okay. And then we flew down to Italy, then flew down to Forley with the Durham Light Infantry, because we crossed to Athens, Piraeus. Civil war had broken out. Oh, in, in, in Greece. The, mm. In in Greece. Elas. Mm. So we went to try and dispel that. And then we landed in that was from Forley. The first time I'd flown. That was in a military aircraft. From Forley to Athens. Then we got involved 
in that skirmish. And we moved up the Patrast, up the Gulf of Cor up the Gulf of Corinth, to Patras, a place called Patras. Have you heard of it? Patras, Patras. Oh, then that was. We had Christmas in Athens. It was, was 1944, 1944. 1944, yeah, 44. Then we were on our way back to Italy by sea when the Germans surrendered in May. And we landed in, back in Italy. And then there was more trouble in Yugoslavia. So we went to Yugoslavia. That was another civil uprising. What was, the, what was it like when you heard that Germany had surrendered? Oh, we were all delighted. At last, we, the war's over, but I'm safe. You, you think of yourself. You think, oh God, I've come through it. But then, that was in the, and then we've got, I went with the Dermite to Austria, to a place called Lebring. And it, and that was near Graz. Graz, Vienna's the largest city, Graz is the second, and we were in a village called Lebring, L-E-B-R-I-N-G, little village, nice, lovely. And um, I had, and these Durham, light infantry men I was with, they hadn't been abroad since they left England in 1943 and I left England in 1942 and they were getting leave back in England before I was. So I went to see the Padre uh, in, and I, I said I've been out here, I left England in May 42 and these Durham men, they've not been out here and they're going home on leave. In the meantime, I'd written to your mum about not coming, and she went to see the MP. <laughs> I told her, I said, go and see the member from Parliament. It was a chap named Noel Baker. Have you heard of him? Noel mm. Baker was the MP for Derby. Mm. And I said, wait till he's got some, uh, um, what do they call them? Uh, uh, um, and they've interviewed the local people. And your mum went to see him. Surgery. surgery. Yes, surgery. for surgery. And told him that uh, I'd been out abroad since 1942. And he and the padre that I spoke to in Italy, between them, they got uh, not me a month's leave. And I came home in 1945. Um, and Vivian was born the following year. In '46, when I came home, she was three months old. To Levering, this village, and the, the the Russians had been there before we had, and they'd been pretty harsh. But when I got back, we were in a school, billeted in a school room, the village school. And the morning I got back, which was on a Saturday, they. The company, which was headquarter company, was we'd be we were going to be welcomed by the burgomaster. That's the mayor of, mayor of the village, and there was going to be followed by refreshments and a dance in the village hall. Well, I got back, and when I did get back, I went into the room that we were in in the school, and I looked in the playground, and they were all lined up there. And the mayor and the choir were singing, welcome to British troops. And it finished with a dance at night time in the village hall. Well, I'd just come back and I was a bit fed up. And then two of my pals came and said, oh, come on, we've got three girls. They want some partners. And I could hear the music playing, typical German music. And I said, no, I, I, I don't feel, oh, come on, you'll be all right. Forget the you've had your leave, and I went with my three sisters, Maria, Gretel, and Julie, and the name was Crowbath. 
K-R-O-B-A-T-H. Julie Crowbar, Maria Crowbar, who was the eldest, and Gretel, who was the youngest, and they were all farmers' daughters. And then I went to Mass on the following morning in the village church, Roman Catholic, and I was only, and they were all in the pew. And they introduced me to the mother, Frau, Frau, Crowback. Frau Crowback. And then they invited me to their pew. And I got, I used to go and spend a lot of time there, working in the farm. And then when I came home, they came to the station to see me off. And then I had a letter from Julie. That was the one that really, but I, I felt sorry for Julie in a way, because we used to have dances every month. But to begin with, there was no fraternisation. You couldn't chat to German girls. But it eventually, or oh, even when we had this dance this night time, the, the commanding officer, left uh, uh, Captain John, he had to get permission from the colonel for us to attend this village dance. Then it became, and then we used to have a dance every month. And the girls used to be brought in army vehicles. To Why were you in at Vienna though? Why were you in Austria? <clears throat> oh, forces of occupation. The Austrians were enemies. I thought they were neutral. Oh no, the Germans. Oh. The, the, the Germans. That's why there were so few men around. They were all in prisoner camps. Or still, and the, all the girls were free. Mm. But they wanted men. We went to a dance one night. And three of the three girls, Maria, she was the eldest, and, um, and she could speak a bit of English. But Julia and Gretel couldn't. And we went to. And one night we had to dance there, and a girl from the next village could speak English, and it was explained to them that, you know, we used to have what's known as a general excuse me, or a lady's privilege. That meant you had to dance, and the lady could go and ask a, a, a man for the dance. And that's normally it's the other way. The man goes to the woman. May I have this dance, please? We don't do that now. But in the, then this one dance, it was known as a lady's privilege. And the lady could come and ask, well, this girl from the next village came to me. Come, come, and it's perfect English. Can I have this dance? So I danced with her. And she began to persist. Then we used to have what's known as an excuse me. You could be dancing and you could be tapped on the shoulder. Excuse me, please. And this girl kept coming to me, and Julie wasn't very pleased, and she disappeared. Oh dear. And I said to Gretel, where's Julie? What's happened to her? I said, what are you going? And she was crying in the latest <laughs> room, because she couldn't speak English, and she felt out of it. Oh, poor Julie. And I had a letter from her, I came home in German. and. Uh, Someone decided it, and she, oh dear, it's a long story. Anyway, anyway you it. you were married. So, oh, I was married then, and, and she knew it. I told her I was for high right, married. So when did you finally leave Austria? When I when I came home to get demobbed. Oh, okay. That when? was in uh, August. August. 19th. You were born in April, May, June, July. July. You were three months when I came home. I came home. You went home to Derby? Went home to Baxter Square. We'd been allocated the house in the meantime. Can you just try, I, it'd be hard, but just to sum up the experience of the war? My experience of the war. There were some nice things about it. There were some terrible things about him. He's, he's not looking at me again. Oh. But uh, it's something that you, you, you've no control over. You've just got to do as you were told, to the best of your ability. Strict military uh, discipline. 
and you live to live, you learn to live with it, but you long for the day when it's all over and you're back home with the people that you love and want to be with. That's, uh, that's in, a, in a nutshell. So when did you first meet Nanny? First met her in the Rialto Ballroom in Derby in 1937. Was it love at first sight? Not really. I, it was from her, but that's what she said. Not from you? No, it, it was Grant Eccles that told me. She'd said that when she saw me, she was the only one. And even if I had to give her a baby, she wanted me to, me, uh, to be with me. Yeah. But you didn't fall in love with her at first sight? Not, not to begin with. Why not? Well, there were others on the scene at the time. <laughs> but then I, then we all got together, four of us, and three of us, the four of us men, three of us met our wives at the Rialto. Yeah, my cousin when, Arthur. When did you get married? We got married in February 1942, 23rd of February. And how many years were you married? 66, before she died. What, what are your memories of Nanny? Oh, very capable, loving. I loved her dearly, yeah. There was never anyone else after that. She always used to say that, oh, you can have your pick. And I said, I've got my pick with you. <laughs> You're the one. What was, what was she like as a, as a person? Oh, lovely dancer, uh, capable, good housewife, good homemaker, like your mum and Jenny, good homemakers. Yeah, I couldn't have picked better. None of the. But I also say I was, I was hard. Particularly to me and Mum and Phil, because I was so. Well, when you do six years and live, live for what I've lived through, you don't come back the same person. Right. It changes you. And it takes you some time to realise that. That, uh, and I often think that I was unkind and not, not to your mum and to Phil. And I'm sorry about that. I felt I could have treated them better. I mean, Phil used to want to watch much of the day. And I used to, you know, your bed's at seven o'clock or eight o'clock. And I was, and I thought, why did I do that? My father was just the opposite. It was too easy, my father was, I never knew my father. Now, mum's up. Her father had a strap that he used to hit Les and Ray, to with, Ray with if they misbehaved. Really? Uh, my, fa my father never laid a hand on us. On me and my mother was a disciplinarian, but not with brutality, but mm. verbally. Mm. We were never hit, Bill and I, like some kids were. A phenomenal memory. Yeah, I think so, I have it. So what do you yeah. attribute your healthy life, your continuing healthy life? Well, what have I done different to other people? I don't know. I've, done, I've, done, I've worked, given work to the best of my ability. Obviously I've been satisfactory. So good I've never been sacked from a job or criticised. Good genes. Good hmm? genes. Sorry? Good genes? Well, I don't know so much. I mean, my mother died at 49. Yeah. My father died about 68. I don't know. I mean, yet my grandparents on both sides, the, the, the Mars, lived to the, well into their 80s. And my father's mother, lived to in her nineties and my father's brother Will, he's well into his eighties. 
So whether in the, in the mm. background of... Mm. But I've never smoked in my life, and I think that might have been a contributory factor. Mm. My lungs have always been good. Mm. I've never been short of breath. No. I could always run, skip, jump, <laughs> play foot sport. And you're still an avid um, football and cricket supporter. More, more cricket than football. I, li I like to see. I wouldn't pay to go to a football match ever again. Would Never. You, would you pay to go to a cricket match? Oh yes, I would. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I'm glad we'd like to f finish by asking you to recite a poem of your choice. As what, Jess? Sorry? To recite a poem of your choice. If I could recite a poem of my choice. The donkey. The donkey would figure in. Um, and then again, Lord Tennyson's Under the white and starry sky Dig the grave and let me lie. Glad did I live and gladly die, and I laid me down with a will. This be the verse that you grave for me. Here he lies where he longed to be. Home is the sailor, home from the sea, and the hunter, home from the hill. I used to like that. Yeah. Then the donkey used to figure. Can you I'm, remember that? Uh, the donkey. When fishes flew and forests walked, and figs grew upon thorn, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry, and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody of all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth, of ancient crooked will, Stars scourge deride me, I am dumb, I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears, and palms before my feet. The donkey, G.K. Chesterton. Oh, did you, did, was that all of it? That was, that was yeah. the fool. Was it? Yeah. Oh. Fools, for I also had my hour. One far feels sour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet. Well, thank you for being interviewed today. You're very welcome. Les King. <laughs> I've enjoyed it immensely. I'm pleased that you have. I look forward to seeing the finished article. Yes. Thank you for taking the trouble to talk me out. <laughs> thank you so much. And I'm an impartial judge. Well done. You've done very well. Oh, thank you, dear. We're very proud of you. That's nice to know. Thank you. Here's to the next 90 years. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I hope I can emulate you. Oh, in the same I'm sure fashion. you will. <laughs>